one person more than any other, helped me to recognize the truths that we're studying today. Three years ago this past week, our good friend Laura Pennard went to be with the Lord. Her life and death had a lasting impact on many of us, not least my family, as we've welcomed her sons Bobby and Johnny to be part of our clan. Over the years, as many of you know, Laura had a lot of struggles. On top of the medical issues, she had employment issues, relational issues, and financial issues. And finding her way out of these things didn't always go the way she hoped. But a lot of people helped her. And the role that I found myself taking most often was to be the cheerleader, the encourager, applauding the positives and helping her pass the negatives. I'm sorry that didn't work. Let's try this. Let's try this other. Let's keep trying, Laura. And Laura was very sensitive, and she would emotionally collapse for a while when she found out she'd made a mistake or something bad had happened. But she was also overall very positive and optimistic, always ready to take hold of the next possible alternative. She responded incredibly well to encouragement. So I consciously became her cheerleader right to the end. And this showed me the power of cheerleading. Words of encouragement have incredible power to heal and to bless. And scripture teaches this especially in the book of Proverbs. So this morning, I want to walk through a number of verses in that book and see its testimony to the healing and blessing that our words can bring. And as we do that, I want us to consider the following application. Word and reword until your words are positive and encouraging. Those who have hung out with me will recognize this as one way of saying part of the tongue's prayer. Should I say anything? What should I say? And how should I say it? How can I say this in a way that's positive and encouraging? And this isn't just some kind of verbal trick. Jesus is the one who told us that the tongue and the heart are intimately related. So that being the cheerleader in your family and speaking and encouraging in positive ways is as much a heart issue as it is a words issue. Jesus says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this is what defiles a person, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, the things that come out of the heart. So as we study these verses, we need not only to be wording and rewording until our words are positive and encouraging, but we need to be praying and repraying for Jesus to make our hearts right, that they would match the words we speak. So the verse I've chosen as the key verse for this study is Proverbs 16, 24. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweet is to the soul, and health to the body. It's a great, great verse. First, it's visually great because honey and the honeycomb are beautiful works of God's art. And it's even a great taste image, as I showed the children. We know the appeal of sweetness, especially in contrast to sourness or bitterness. And what this verse compares to sweetness is gracious words, gracious speech. The Hebrew word means pleasant, sweet, delightful, beautiful, lovely, agreeable speech. The, the word is used in physical beauty in Song of Solomon. It's used of the beauty of a good land, Issachar's portion in the land of Canaan. It's used of the taste of bread and the music of the lyre. In Proverbs, in addition to describing our speech, it's used to describe wisdom and knowledge as beautiful. Occasionally, it's used of God. Psalm 135, 3. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for he is beautiful or pleasant. Psalm 27, 4. One, other thing, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. It's, it's Psalm 90, verse 17. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us, as David Jackson sings. So it is this sweet beauty 
that should now characterize our words, characterize our speech. This kind of speech, this verse says, is sweetness to our souls. It's health to our bodies. It has incredible positive impact. And I know that's true in my own life. One of the people I meet with irregularly because of our schedules is David Jackson. And I love it when we can get together, but he also frequently ministers to me through the brief text conversations we have when we can't meet. For example, back in May, we had a conversation in which he reminded me that his love covers, conquers, and caresses us with grace. To delight in his good love is to delight in what we most long for. Those are gracious words, and they were sweetness to my soul that day. So we need to try to be speaking this way in our families. Tina just came back from South Africa. Amazing trip, which she'd love to tell you about if she could stay awake this morning. But while she was there, she had a couple of low moments, and in one of them she wrote, So weary, Daddy, so many starving children, so much need. Please pray for strength. My back is hurting and so is my heart. I'm doing exactly what I love, but it's hard, so hard. And I thought and prayed about how, to, how I could respond to that, and I remembered a phrase from Second Timothy, You then, my child, be strengthened in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I thought, that's great, but I felt like it wasn't enough. So I added a further prayer from Colossians. May you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. A little bit later, Tina texted, Amen, thanks. I really needed that heart. So that's me trying to share encouraging words. And it doesn't have to be scripture. I also texted her that I was ordering some brand new Sweet Maria's coffee to be here when she got back. And I left a pot of that at home this morning that I suspect she's greatly enjoyed already. But the point of the verse and of the examples is that gracious and encouraging words are sweet to the soul and physically restoring. Now it's true that sometimes the words you consider encouraging may not always be heard that way. I recognize that. But if you will word and reword in your mind before you speak, God will often bless your words. Jesus told us that one of the things the Holy Spirit would do is give us the words to say. And if a person still doesn't receive those words, we should pray that our words would not give any reason for offense. We can try to positively clarify and to think together with the person about what we're trying to say, and we must leave the outcome in God's hands. Sometimes people can't or won't be encouraged. But negative reactions don't change our responsibility to speak to family members using these positive, encouraging words. So the key verse directly supports our key idea that words of encouragement have incredible power to heal and to bless. And the rest of these verses reinforce that in specific ways. The next one comes from what I call the my son section of Proverbs. Chapter 4, verses 20 to 22, My son, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my sayings, let them not escape from your sight, keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them, and healing to all their flesh. These are words from a father to a son, and those words spoken in the heart of a family. And this father is pleading with his son to heed these words. Be attentive, incline your ear, let them not escape, keep them in your heart. <laughs> and then we don't hear the words themselves at this point in Proverbs. We assume there are words of instruction like those that follow. But we get the distinct impression, and we're not told this either, but the distinct impression that this father is not yelling at his son. He's not berating him. He's speaking heart to heart. Why? because he knows his instruction has incredible power to heal and to bless. These words, he says, are life. 
They're intended to build up and nourish his son. His words are physically beneficial, bringing healing to the flesh. The principles of blessing and healing affirmed in the first verse are true in the heart of your family. Here's another one, Proverbs 12, 25. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. This also is about your family. You have family members who are weighed down by anxiety. Your children, your parents, your brother or sister. I really don't think my family is unique in this, and I can tell you that we take turns. We go through cycles where each after the other gets burdened by things that weigh us down, and sometimes all at once. So it could be in our families that we are too busy, that we're sick, that someone else beside us is sick or injured or hospitalized or we're burdened with that. Maybe we're facing challenges at work. Maybe we're caught up in relational conflicts, moral dilemmas, fear. Anxiety is real, but a good word can help an anxious person come out of it. So what do you say when a person is weighed down by anxiety? I admit you have to be careful. Some people are not tremendously helped by being told, don't worry, be happy, everything will be okay. And the other extreme isn't a very good option either. Many of you know that I love David and Karen Maines' books, The Tales of the Kingdom. In several little stories, a group of beings appear who are servants of the enemy and they are called naysayers. And their chant is, Nothing has been done, nothing is being done, nothing will be done, nay, nay, nay. Sometimes we're almost that negative. In our family, we call these Eeyore moments. We have to have something other than blind optimism and other than a pity party. And I believe the good words that most often cheer are care and pray. The people in your family need to know you care. Your words can powerfully communicate this. But recognize that your words are more than just words. You also communicate with body language and tone of voice. And it's when your attention and your heart and your tone of voice all line up behind the message that I care about how you're feeling, that can, that can make a huge difference for a person. Okay, I just have to stop now and show one of the great YouTube videos of recent months. It gently mocks my lifelong teaching that all your wife really needs is for you to listen and to care. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's going to stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever going to stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there... Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing... You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like there's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! So, so let me point out, guys, and, and parents, if you're in this with your kids, it, it is usually not about the nail. <laughs> in, in this case, it was, but usually people weighed down by anxiety are right in thinking that you can't solve their problems, that they need you to care, and they need you to pray. 
I mean, you can encourage your family members directly about the faithfulness of God and the peace that he offers, but you might just as well pray with them. And again, pray scripture. A while back, I asked the high school, I was asking the high school class to pick one of Paul's prayers that especially struck them, and then I would pray it for them and with them. And Bobby picked out one that I came to recognize as a very important one for this whole subject. In Romans, Paul prays, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is a great prayer to reword and pray for someone weighed down by anxiety. So be the cheerleader and be the cheer prayer for other people. Be the gentle encourager. But choose your words carefully. Word and reword until your words are positive and encouraging. Proverbs 15.4. A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love them will eat its fruits. Words are powerful. How can we use them to encourage? Let me make a few practical suggestions. First, and you've heard this before, avoid absolutes. Avoid blanket statements. You always put me down in front of my friends. You never finish anything I tell you to do. You always assume the worst of me. You never take the time to understand what I'm trying to achieve. And so on and so on. Always and never and always and never. Now, if you do have to critique for the sake of communication, whatever you do, don't exaggerate. Instead, Sometimes I feel put down in front of my friends. It seems, it seems at times that you expect me to fail, but, but at times suddenly we feel like you're not really taking into account our goals for you, even in the simple case of finishing your tasks, combined with tone of voice and body language, those two conversations can be really, really different. And the main difference is that both of the people in that dispute were willing to forego absolutes and to embrace gracious words. Words are life and death to relationships, especially in the family. And that leads to my second suggestion that I make frequently, and that's embrace tentativeness. It is more powerful to get someone to think than it is to tell them what to do or how they're wrong. Tentativeness means offering positive advice as suggestion. I mean, think about it. Why waste commands on people you can't order around? And even if you do have the right to tell someone what to do, don't use commands unless you absolutely have to. I'm wondering if you wouldn't find it more powerful to approach the solution tentatively in a way that helps people embrace what you're communicating. I remember years ago when I gave this advice in premarital counseling to a couple who were at that uh, gift registry stage of one in preparation. So they'd go to a store and she would say, which one do you like? And he would say, I like that one. And she would think that was absolute. She didn't want to disagree with them. So stuff she really didn't like was getting onto the list. But then he learned to say, well... I kind of like that one, but I'm open to some of these others. And that gave her permission to point out other ones and they could decide together, which really reduced her frustration. The value of tentativeness. It's incredibly powerful, folks. Don't get me wrong on this. I'm serious. Being tentative is incredibly powerful in communication. My third suggestion is that you practice rewording negative statements positively. Eliminate words like not, neither, nor, and never. Now, recognizing the tone of voice and body language can make almost any statement come out negative, it's still helpful to avoid these kinds of words. Now, you'll say to me, what about the Ten Commandments? They're negative, do not murder, do not steal, do not lie. And they're very valuable and important. And I agree they are. 
But when Jesus was asked to summarize the commandments, he chose positives. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Those words would have been much less powerful if he'd said, don't hate God and don't hate your neighbor. Yet in families, we tend to communicate frequently in negatives. Don't do that. You may not. Never. So you need to practice making positive statements. Instead of, don't sit in that chair and watch YouTube all day. How about, I really think you'd feel better with some exercise. What can you do to find, what can you find to keep yourself busy this morning? Instead of absolute negatives like, Mom, you never let me do anything with my friends. How about, okay, Mom, I see that this morning, but I'd really like to work out a time when I can go and see so-and-so. So let's practice a few. You silently fill in the blanks here. What would be a positive wording for if you can't get your room clean, you're never going to get a driver's license? Think about that. How about don't eat the mashed potatoes with your fingers? <laughs> this is real from my family. <laughs> Here's an easy one that my mom never figured out. She used to say, you don't look as fat as you used to. <laughs> I'm sure you can reward that positively. But here's a hard one. You're an idiot. You'll never amount to anything. There is no good way to reward that positively. <laughs> the only thing you can do is to not say it in the first place. Or what should I say? How should I say it? In fact, I would strongly uh, encourage you to avoid all negative character assessments. If you tell someone, your spouse, your child, your parent, that they're a lazy, worthless slob, they will be shaped by that assessment for a long, long time. Maybe they'll be shaped for, toward anger and rebellion. Maybe toward agreeing with you in self-despair. But words shape people. So word and reword until your words are positive and encouraging. It's not that hard to think before we speak, and yet every one of us has said things that we regret and things that hurt people. And what's sad is that the alternate isn't that hard and that it brings so much blessing. The, the, the sense that, that my daddy believes I can do this. The, the thought that with a little more effort, I can do my best work yet. The, the simple confidence that my, my husband, my wife, my mom, my dad, my son, my daughter, my brother, my sister, they love me. Or maybe even better, they like me. This is powerful medicine against the ills of a word world that wants to destroy us. Scripture attests to the power of this, Proverbs 12, 18. There is one whose rash words are like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Your words can hurt, your words can heal, and healing words are a beautiful thing. Proverbs 25. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Like a gold ring or an ornament of gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. Like the cold of snow in the time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him. He refreshes the soul of his masters. I know you love the imagery there. The author compares gracious words famously. <laughs> he famously compares them, these words, to the beauty of gold and to the beauty of silver and to the refreshment of cold snow on a hot day. In the Middle East... That would be the closest thing you would ever get to ice water. Maybe it happens once or twice in a lifetime, but they remembered it. It was at least as precious as gold. And, being, and it's being compared to the words of a faithful messenger, a wise reprover, words fitly spoken are this beautiful. So reword and reword until your words are positive and encouraging. There are countless examples in literature of parents who encourage their children just this way. I think of Ben Carson, the neurosurgeon who was born in poverty in Detroit and whose mom was his cheerleader. When Ben was in fifth grade, he was doing terribly at school and was universally called a dummy. 
In that fall, when Ben received his midterm grades, he wasn't surprised to see Fs in most of his subjects. When Ben got home that day, he dropped his books on the table, hoping his mother wouldn't see his report card. But that didn't happen. Benny, is this your midterm report, she asked, looking it over. Yes, ma'am, Ben replied, but it doesn't mean much. No, Benny, she said, it means a lot. If you keep making grades like this, you'll spend the rest of your life sweeping floors in a factory, and that's not what God wants for you. She pulled Ben and her other son, Curtis, close to her. They looked right. She looked into her eyes, and she said, Boys, I don't know what to do, but God promises in the Bible to give wisdom to those who ask. So tonight I'm going to pray for wisdom. I'm going to ask God what I need to do to help you to. A couple days later, the boys found out God's answer to their, mother, to their mother's prayer, and they didn't like it much. God says we need to turn off the television, Sonia told her sons. You may choose three TV shows to watch each week, but that's all. And you will use the extra time for reading. So naturally, the boys complained. They tried to change their mind, but their mother wasn't finished. You're also to write two book reports every week about what you read. Then you can present your book reports out loud to me. So these boys reluctantly selected a stack of books, the nearest branch of the Detroit Public Library, some people thought Ben's mother was being too hard on her sons. Several of her friends talked to her, telling her the boys needed, needed the time to play outside. They warned her that Curtis and Ben would hate her for making them, tur her, them turn off the TV and read and write those reports. But the people were wrong. Ben never hated his mother. Yes, he told her she was making them work too hard, but inside he knew that she loved him and Curtis and only wanted the best for them. Ben believed her when she said that if he tried, he could do anything he wanted to do. Cheerleader. Sonia Carson had high expectations for Curtis and Ben. She never let them forget it. She observed the lives and habits of the successful wealthy people whose houses she claimed. She said, they're no different from us. Anything they can do, you can do. And if you really want to and work hard, you can do it better. And like most cheerleaders, her encouragement was directed not just toward the boys, but against the opposing team, those who would naysay in their lives. When other parents questioned her choices, she would tell them, say what you want, but my boys are going to be something. They're going to become self-supporting and learn how to love other folks. And no matter what they decide to do, they're going to be the best in the world at it. And Ben Carson went on to become one of the best neurosurgeons the world has known. So what have we said? Very simple. Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, health to the body. Words of encouragement have incredible power to heal and to bless. So what are you going to do? Word and reword, think and rethink, pray and repray you're able to say things in ways that are positive and encouraging. Let's pray together. Lord God, we desire to have a positive impact in the lives of our family members, or in our wives, our husbands, our children, even our parents. Lord, in the lives of our brothers and sisters. Well, Lord God, I confess it's so easy to fall into negative wording, negative ways of presenting things, negative body language, negative tone of voice. Lord God, my prayer for myself and for all of us here today is that we would learn to say things positively, that we would learn to say things that encourage. Lord, that... Uh, but people will look back at us and say, yeah, that was the cheerleader in my life. I don't know if I would have made it without that encouragement. Lord, we can't do that on our own. We rely on your power, but we long for that outcome. We want to be those who make a positive difference. So give us the words, Lord Jesus. Give us the words in your name.